something about your church, something that someone might not know? Well, my church, uh, Grace for the Nations, has been in existence for 19 years, and we have a wonderful pastor and first lady, lady uh, Pastor Terrence Lachey and Lady Eva Lachey. And um, I've worked in various ministries in this church. Uh, my husband and I are currently over the Christian Ed Ministry, and we implemented Grace Cares last year, which is our outreach to help <laughs> which is our outreach to um, help those that are in need. We provide personal need items. So that's something hopefully people uh, will come to know that if you need personal need items, we're here and we're available to give those to you. Well, one thing about my church is that I've been here almost 18 of the 19 years and I live in Lansing and I have been driving and commuting for all that time. And one thing about my church, I'd like them to know that it has been worth every mile coming. A uh, short testimony because I know the saints have been praying for me for different reasons of health, but I was going for these treatments every Wednesday and all of a sudden I ended up with a torn tendon in my shoulder and I couldn't raise my hand any higher than this, but uh, a couple weeks ago, total breakthrough and both of my hands are going up and that was my goal. So about my church, I thank God for the prayers of the saints and the prayers of the righteous that availeth much. That's the most thing I want you to know about this church. What may your worthy your praise? All we are is glory's reflection. We'll bless your name. We'll bless your name. We'll bless your name. We'll bless your name. And your kindness unmatchable. There's grace for guilt, there's grace for all. You are light for the path unknown. And Lord, without you, where will we go? You're the way. Everybody, praise the Lord. Everybody. Praise 
the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Right where we are, we want you to type that in the comments. Praise the Lord. We are going to sing to the glory of God. We want his glory to rise. We want his songs to rise. We want the power to rise. No yes. matter where you are right now, where you're watching, the glory of the Lord can rise right there. All you got to do is sing. All right? Let's do it. Y'all ready, man? Here we go. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. We say, oh, let it rise. We say, oh. Lord, rise among us. Can you say, Let the glory of the Lord let it rise? rise let the glory of the Lord let it rise. And let the praises of our King let it rise. Rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, 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 oh. say, Let the glory of the Lord let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord. Let it rise. rise and let the, the praises of our King. Of our let it rise. Rise among us. Let it rise. We say, oh, oh, let it rise. Let it rise. We say, oh, oh, oh. say, let it rise. Let the song of the Lord, let it rise. Let the song of the Lord, let it rise. And let the joy of our King, let it rise. Oh, let the song of the Lord, let it rise. Let the song of the Lord, let it rise. Joy of our King, let it rise. We need the joy to rise, and we say, Oh, let it rise. Say, Oh,
rise, say let your, let your glory, glory, let it, let it rise. rise. Say let your, let your glory, glory, let it, let it rise. rise. Say let your, let your glory, glory, let it, let it rise. rise. Say let your, let your glory, glory, let it, let it rise. rise. Say let your, let your power, power, let it, let it rise. rise. Say let your, let your power. Hello everyone, my name is Vidra Gant and I'm bringing to you today for prayer focus, Renewed Strength. And that's taken from the book of Isaiah, 40th chapter, 30 through the 31st verse. And it reads, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us pray. Dear Lord God Almighty, we bless your holy name today and we thank you for being ruler and super ruler in our lives. We thank you because you have made ways out of no way and you provided us with new, renewed strength. We thank you for what you have given us. We thank you for this day and the word that you have prepared for us. We ask that you will continue to strengthen and keep us, Lord, manifest in our lives today, that we can move forward strengthened and encouraged in your word. And we bless you and we honor you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Grace, I've learned especially how to um, study my word and and let it resonate in me and, and to understand it. I've learned how to understand what I'm reading more as I've been at Grace. You don't know 
um, at Sunday school, you get like the best snacks because we have like the, the, the best cooker, like Sister Cass, she, she, she's very good at cooking and the snacks are always really good. And um, also like I get to record so the messages are always like really feeling to the heart. And yeah, I really like recording at the church. It's a really good opportunity to improve your videography skills. And um, I really like listening to the service going on and it's always like something that you would want to hear, you don't want to miss out on, so yeah. The table of the Lord is a place of connecting, communing, a place of correction, and a place of reflection. Having a seat at the table is an honor and a privilege. The Lord's table is spread before us, even in the presence of our enemies. The Lord provides dinner in the desert, and everyone is welcome at the table of the Lord. Gracious greetings and welcome to Grace for the Nation's Church. This is Pastor Lachey, and you're tuned into a Sunday morning message. This is a great day to be alive. It's also the day the Lord has made, so we should rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to start a series today um, based on the table of the Lord, the table of the Lord being spread before us, as well as all of the intricate details that come with the literal hundreds of times that the scriptures reference the word table got a lot in store. And as you can tell, I like to teach the Word of God. So why don't you call somebody, text somebody, maybe even share this with somebody and let them know that the pastor's teaching a message on the table of the Lord. When we get into this message, you're going to be discovering some things that might be new to you, but we'll also rehearse some things that are quite familiar. And as we get into the Word of God, I am praying that our outtake conversations on Wednesday that will be hosted by some of your brothers and sisters in the Lord will bring about a dialogue, a conversation, bring about uh, an opportunity to study and to go even deeper as we look at this prophetic message. Let's have a word of prayer and then afterwards we'll get into this message. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another time in your word. We thank you for the richness and the opportunity to share the revelations of truth that comes from studying and sharing the word. I pray, Father, for wisdom to flow. I pray for revelation. I pray for even inspiration. I pray for there to be an anointing on everything that is spoken and said over these, this series in these weeks. I pray, Father, that our dialogue and our conversation would be enriching and that in some way we would grow more in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ your son, who you sent to this world to die for us, that we might live with you. Father, I thank you and I praise you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do through Grace for the Nation's Church and how we're impacting and touching the world with these biblical principles and life application of scripture. Anoint this word fresh, Father, and get the glory in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I thought about a revelation that God gave me um, earlier in the year when we were going through our COVID quarantines and all of those experiences relating to this pandemic, I saw an open vision and it was um, an open vision of a large cloth being spread out with a variety of items on that, on that cloth, somewhat like a feast or a picnic. And I saw in the midst of um, that full arrangement, an actual disruption where the cloth was just taken and tossed and everything that was on that cloth was released into the air. And there was such a, a disarray and such uh, a catastrophic experience. The wind was blowing and some of the items literally fell to the cloth and others were just blown away. And I prayed about that and asked God to give me a greater revelation. And even in pondering on this message series, what could this mean? And I just believe that as we see open visions or we have dreams, God is speaking to us expressly by the Spirit of God. And so the interpretation of that is that there is a lot of changing, a lot of shifting and things that are staple to us or even things that are considered delicacies or, or delights to us are being moved and shaken out of their places. And as the Lord showed me that those hands that literally shook the cloth and moved all of those items was a hand of authority and it was the hand of the Lord. And he's shifting some things now, even now, to where it's unfamiliar to us. But he's also replacing and resetting his table in which he's inviting us. I want to share some things over these next couple of weeks about how the Lord will prepare for us dinner even in the desert. Dinner in the desert. How God has prepared a table for us that we are welcome to come to as his sons and daughters and his invited guests with Jesus Christ being the host. 
And so as we study this, I want you to become intrigued with the word, but also hungry for revelation and pray as I try to share this word with you over these next couple of weeks. Let's go to some scripture. Let's start in the um, gospel. I believe gospel according to St. Luke is a good place to begin. And it's during the Last Supper, or what often we identify as the Lord's Supper, it took place at a table. It took place at a familiar location that they were considered to hang out in or fellowship in on a regular basis. It was the upper room. It was the place in which the Lord had commanded them to go and book and find and set a table and, and spread it out where they would be able to eat the Passover. You see, the tradition of the table from Old Testament and New Testament is that it was a place of gathering. It was a place of comfort, a place of conference, and also a place of correction. You see, the table of the Lord or a Lord's house was the place in which the guests were invited if they were favorable or people were banished from if they were in offense of the king. So we'll learn more about the spiritual implications of the table and the props or the table that's set behind us is just simply a, a type likeness or a shadow. There's always bread at the table of the Lord and wine and oil at the table of the Lord. And we'll see how when God sets this table for betrayal, he sets it up like any other table that we have seen in scripture. So the feast of the unleavened bread was upon the disciples and they were prepared to eat the Passover supper. Verse number six of the 22nd chapter of Luke says this, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They ask. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I might eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. And they left and they found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. I'll pause there. I read through the 13th verse that Jesus gives some specifics about preparing for this supper. And, and the room that he identifies to them is through the vision that this place exists. They had never seen it before, and they had entered into Jerusalem many times. But on this particular occasion, he says, follow a man carrying a jar. I think about how God is so uh, minute in detail and how he covers every exact thing that the, at the appropriate time, this man was walking by carrying a jar and the disciples were able to see things just as Jesus had depicted to them. And he led them to a room that had everything laid out for them to prepare the table of the Lord. Now, I'm going to get into some prophetic references of the table of the Lord in this message, but I want you to consider for a moment a visual of this room being set up for a banquet, a feast, to not only house Jesus and his um, 12 that followed him very closely, but a total of 120 people gathered in that room off and on based on the number of people that we find on the day of Pentecost in that same room that received the power in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You see, everything happens around the table. I think of the boardrooms of corporate America. I think of the dinner tables of a family. I think of one lonely table in a dorm room, perhaps with one student preparing for the rest of their lives. Think for a moment about the significance of a table that it holds knowledge, it holds wisdom, it holds even the elements of life itself, whether it be a meal or drink for the soul. But the table that God establishes is the foundational place by which trans transactions occur. And so the table of the Lord is being spread so that the feast of God will be able to happen. It's the feast of the unleavened bread. It's the Passover supper that was practiced and is still practiced today, known as the Seder. And it's practiced by those of Jewish descent and those of Hasidic, uh, of, of Hasidic families. Think for a moment about how God chose a cultural practice, a cultural norm to reveal to us something that can 
meet the needs of every culture on the planet. Every group of people encounters somehow a table at some point in their lives. If it's an operating table or a birthing table, even if it's the cooling board after death in which a body is prepared for burial, you see a table is simply a place where God has chosen to give us a a level-minded positioning to work through life difficulties. So the table that is spoken of in Luke's gospel is a table that the Passover supper was set. And the deception of Satan enters into the heart of Judas, one of Jesus' closest disciples, and he portrays him at the table. He literally at the Lord's Supper, this this dinner table where there is invitation only and there is a welcoming feast and a jovialness among them, conversation perhaps about the miracles that were performed or the places that they had been or the signs and wonders that they had seen. The deception takes place even at that table. You see, at the table, Jesus shares with his disciples the plan. He says, I'm going away. He shares with them the plan that many times we've sat and we've eaten, but you're not going to eat with me here on earth much more. What's going to happen is that there's a feast that my father has prepared for the end times of which you will be welcome to be a part of the table of the Lord. But Psalms 23 is where I'd like to go. And we'll come back to the book of Luke. I want to show you something that in familiarity, we quote the 23rd Psalms often, probably one of the first verses, passages of scripture that we learned as believers, early believers. I learned it as a kid, even before I'd accepted Christ as my savior. But let's read it intently and let's look for the relevance of the table in the midst of this desert. You see, when this psalm is written, it is written as a song unto the Lord that speaks of God's goodness, his provision, his protection, and also his plan. His provision, his protection, and his plan. You see, the psalmist writes that the Lord is my shepherd. This is attributed to David because of David's occupation and prior occupation as being a shepherd. He relates to his own experience in being a shepherd and identifying the Lord as his shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want, meaning he provides for me and everything that a sheep needs, a shepherd is there to provide. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, the second verse says. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The fifth verse is where I'd like to draw your focus. And if we were to exegete anything from text today, I want you to apply the principles that I showed you regarding the table being a place of level thinking, the table being a place of provision and fellowship and conference and even correction, the table having a significance in the history of our Christianity. But even before Christ was was materialized in flesh, There's a table that the Lord speaks of here. David, through his revelation, says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Perhaps during his time as a shepherd boy with even the deception of his brothers not believing in him, although he had received an anointing upon his life, perhaps the enemy in that moment were those who didn't believe in his potential. You see, we have enemies as well. And yet, although we are walking through valleys and shadows of death, we don't have fear because even in the desert, he prepares a table. Even while there are onlookers, some have taken this and broken it down theoretically to say that the imagery is that as a shepherd is out in the field, that he finds a smooth place, a rock perhaps, or maybe a hewn piece of wood that he could use to set and have his lunch that the Lord has provided for him. Some imagery is that the Lord has mysteriously provided for us the things that often we take for granted or take credit for, the Lord has provided. Remember, the table of the Lord is a place of provision and it's also a place of protection and it's also a place where plans are made. 
And so the verse tells us that the Lord prepares the table in the presence of your enemies. What are your enemies? Who are your enemies? What is it that distracts you from your purpose that causes you to fear or maybe even second guess yourself? What is it? Who is it? Who are they that we can classify as enemies of God and those who oppose our purpose and our call? It can't be family because remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and against the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, which means that the enemies spoken of here may be visible or they may not be visible. Perhaps the enemies are the enemies in our mind. Perhaps they are the things of our past that haunt us. Perhaps they are the fears of us moving forward, but somehow it is intended by the enemy to distract us from the table that the Lord has prepared. So the table of the Lord is spread for us, even in the presence of our enemies. He goes on to say that you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. That's a testimony for David having been anointed by the prophet as king of Israel. It's a prophetic word even for you that the anointing of the Lord is upon your life. And although we've gone through some things and although we've experienced some things, the table there, even in the midst of our challenges, even in the midst of the naysayers and the gainsayers, even in the midst of those who would love to have our very lives, the Lord spreads the table and the Lord prepares for us a meal. And as we revert to the Luke scripture that Jesus is on the eve of his persecution and ultimately his crucifixion. He experiences a meal with his closest friends for the last time. He experiences something that they had been practicing for three years, gathering and having a meal prepared. I believe that Jesus was sitting at a table when Mary and Martha were there and one was, was a servant to him and the other chose to sit at his feet. I believe that it was at a table that Jesus sat when the woman of ill repute came and bowed before him, breaking open her alabaster box and pouring the oil on his feet and drying him, his feet with her hair after using her tears to moisten the Lord's dry and chapped feet. Think about the table and the potential of us connecting with God in so many ways that we often take for granted, but the table has been spread for us even in the desert. The Lord has prepared for us dinner, a meal of which we can sup. So he says to his disciples, I tell you, 16th verse of Luke 22, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So he speaks of this prophetic experience as being their last supper together on earth. The 17th verse says, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take, this is divided among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks. He took bread just common loaf of bread, perhaps much like this that was baked at a local bakery. He, he takes the bread and he broke the bread and he gave it to them saying, this is my body that is given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. Do what? Sit at the table in remembrance or eat the bread in remembrance? You see, the table is the proverbial place by which there could be portrayers where there could be enemies watching what's happening as we commune and we take the bread of the Lord, which is his body that was broken for us. 20th verse says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He takes a cup, a vessel. He takes something that can be used as a chalice that holds the liquid that they had chosen to drink the fruit of the vine, and he says, take and drink. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who will betray me is with mine own on the table. He says, the 
one who will deceive me is right here at the table. 22nd verse says, the son of man will go as it had been decreed, but woe unto the man that betrays him. And they began to question among themselves, which of them might it be that would do this? So a dispute rose among them. And this is the key point. As to which of them is considered to be the greatest, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest or the least and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? This is Jesus asking a question about the table. You see, in our minds, we are more than happy to consider the anticipation of being at the Lord's table. And I would never deny the Lord. I would never betray the Lord. But let's check ourselves in Scripture. You see, the joy in being able to apply Scripture to our lives today is to find ourselves somewhere in the text. Were you the servant of the bread at the table or just the consumer of the bread at the table? Were you the one who brought the precious things to the table to be blessed and broken and eaten by the Lord himself and his disciples? Or are you one who just simply consumes whatever is already there at the table? I can remember as a child that no matter how hectic things were, no matter how impoverished we were, we were instructed to sit at the table. If we had nothing but a bowl of cereal, cornflakes, not even, not even cereal, generic cornflake to eat but we sat at a table to reflect, to ponder, to contemplate, to share. Even in our moments of despair, the table seemed to have had a significance. And here we find that the table is significant. And he asks the question, who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves the table? It is not the one who's at the table, he says, but I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials and I confer it on you a kingdom. He says, I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and set on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Interesting that he prophesies what will be happening. And as we study throughout this lesson, we are going to look at the references of this, even in the book of Revelation, how the feast of the Lord in the end time is there and that table of the Lord being spread for those from all nations to come and to dine and to sup with the Lord. So as this discourse continues to unfold, we see where the betrayal takes place. We see where Peter is told that he would deny Christ and he denies that he would deny Christ. But so much takes place just at that table. So much around wine and bread. So much around the bitter herbs of the Passover. So much around the unleavened bread. You see, God will prepare a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies, our destiny that will cause us to seemingly lose, but ultimately gain. You see, after that supper, Jesus went out and prayed and he asked his disciples to pray with them. And they couldn't keep up. They couldn't hang out. They, they, they could not because it was not in their heart to understand just yet the significance of them having been at the table, the parable he spoke or the question he asked of what's more important, being at the table or serving the table. He says, I'm a servant. And so I would imagine that if Jesus is identified as the servant and the Lord has spread the table, then we are the partakers and we get the benefits of the Lord's servanthood. What lesson is there in that for us? as those who will be willing to serve more than those who are just simply willing to eat. Let us take in our heart and in our minds the thought that the Lord's table, even in the desert, is sufficient because remember, it is a place of provision for us. It is a place of protection because the enemy can't do any more than what the, the Lord will allow but it's also a place in which plans are fulfilled. You see, the Lord had to experience, Jesus had to experience the betrayal 
in order to be executed in that crucifixion, to die and to be raised gloriously and miraculously from the dead and to be seated now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us that one day we too will sit at the table of his Father. I'm going to close the message here, but I hope that you're able to take some significant elements with you regarding the provision of the Lord and how the protection of God is here and how the plans of God all unfold at the table of the Lord when he prepares for us dinner in the desert. I hope this message blessed you in some way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we spend in your word. We thank you for this introductory lesson on the table of the Lord. I pray that as we mull over the thought and the concepts of this dinner in destitute and desert places that we reflect upon our own lives, situations where we seem to be surrounded by enemies, where it seems to be nothing you provide. Not only do you provide, you also protect us from any of the attacks of the enemy and you let nothing happen outside of your will. So that means that death, destruction, or disease cannot overthrow your plan. You provide for us, you protect us, and you know the plans that you have for us. They're plans of good and not of evil to bring us to an expected end and to give us peace. Father, you've prepared this table, and we're grateful to be invited guests. I pray for everyone here under the sound of my voice now that you would somehow touch them and cause a reflective moment to happen in their lives in which they sat at a table and remembered you as our provider. As they sat at a table and were able to identify your protection. And as we sit at the table, even now, we're able to hear the plans that you have for us. So speak to someone's heart, touch even now, save, heal, and deliver in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, listen, thanks for being a part of this first message in this series. As you can see, there's so much potential for you to do study. On this coming Wednesday, there's going to be a talk back. There'll be two individuals discussing what was um, shared in the message, and they'll be dissecting and and creating references and taking your questions, your live questions um, on this subject matter and this topic of the table of the Lord. So until next time, God bless you. And as always here at Grace for the Nation's Church, we believe there is hope.